I invite Professor Dietrich Peltz to start proceedings. material I'm presenting here has to do with my own work that's all being done with my collaborator Ted Kirkpatrick at the University of Maryland and uh, also in collaboration and interaction with uh, lots of people over the years, um, some of whom I've uh, listed here. So here's an outline. Uh, I'll start out by uh, means of a motivation where I'll just walk you through some phenomenology, okay, just to, to, to make sure what we are talking about before we are trying to understand where, where this phenomenology is coming from. And so I'll start out with uh, an introduction to classical phase transitions then uh, to quantum phase transitions, and then come to the quantum ferromagnetic transition in particular. And I have to see, I have no idea how, how we, are, we are going to proceed here time-wise, so the breakdown into lectures is tentative at this point, and uh, we'll see how far we get. And please interrupt me any time uh, when there's anything unclear, Way, let's uh, talk some phenomenology here. So we are all familiar with uh, ferromagnets. I mean, so the, they live on our fridges, right, and uh, keep things from falling down. And uh, we know, of course, that uh, these magnets are in their ferromagnetic long-range ordered state only below a certain temperature, known as the Curie temperature, which for iron is something like uh, 1070 some kelvins. And so one might ask the question, what will happen if uh, by some way or another we manage to suppress the Curie temperature and look at materials that order ferromagnetically only at rather low temperatures, let's say a few kelvins or maybe a few tens of kelvins. And we could do that by either finding materials that uh, have a low te uh, Curie temperature to start with, or we might also find some way to suppress the Curie temperature of uh, a material we found. And there are actually several ways to do that. So here is uh, one example. Zirconium zinc 2 is a ferromagnet below uh, a temperature of uh, some 20, 28 degrees Kelvin or so. And uh, it turns out that if you subject the material to hydrostatic pressure, then the magnetic order doesn't like the pressure and uh, you can suppress the Curie, Curie temperature even more. And here you see what happens. So there's actually two graphs uh, in one. So at ambient pressure, you see here the magnetization as a function of temperature. And here is that Curie temperature of around 28 kelvins. And uh, then you see as you lower the temperature, magnetization goes up, and it seems to do so in a continuous way. Okay? So this looks pretty much what we expect a ferromagnet to, to do. Um, if you ignore the scales here, that looks very much like what iron or nickel do at their respective Curie temperatures, even though they are much higher. Cool. And now let's do uh, something different. Let's go to a fixed temperature, 2.3 kelvins. So that's somewhere here. And so here is the magnetization in arbitrary units, doesn't matter, uh, at ambient pressure. 
And now what the experimentalists did, so there was Christian Fleiderer's group in this case, um, they applied hydrostatic pressure. And here you see as a function of pressure the magnetization, which was initially 0.17 or so mu bore per formula unit, decreases kind of linearly as a function of pressure. And then um, at a critical pressure of 16 kilobars or something, um, the magnetization goes to zero very, very rapidly. Okay. So here it's zero, here it's non-zero, and here they just lose it at this point. And that's an indication of, of course, a ferromagnetic transition. But if you compare this curve and that curve, then you see here it goes to zero much more rapidly and possibly discontinuously. There are good reasons to believe that uh, it's actually a discontinuous transition at that temperature as a function of pressure. So that's one observation that uh, if you look at a ferromagnetic transition at a really low temperature, then the transition has a tendency to be first order. And um, I'll show you many more examples. That's a very universal observation. It's not tied to this particular material. So uh, here's another example. Uh, magnesium silicide is, strictly speaking, actually not a ferromagnet. Um, it's an interesting material. Um, that crystallizes in a structure that lacks inversion, spatial inversion symmetry. And as a result, uh, you get what's called a zialuszynski moria term in, uh, the, in, in the Hamiltonian that's caused by spin-orbit interaction. And as a result, um, the thing is a ferromagnet in uh, any given plane, but as you go along in a particular direction, the magnetization uh, forms a global spiral. So it's a, it's a helical magnet, but the pitch wave number of the helix is small. The wavelength is something like 200 angstroms. So if you don't look too closely, it looks like a ferromagnet. And I will not talk about the helium magnetic properties of it, which are very interesting. Uh, so let's just, let's just approximate it as a ferromagnet for our purposes. And here, what's plotted is the volume fraction of magnetic, the magnetic part of the system versus the temperature. So, um, if we look at, uh, at fixed pressure for various pressures. So if we look at this temperature pressure phase diagram, it looks a lot like the one for zirconium zinc 2. Here is the ambient pressure Tc. It goes down. And uh, then what happens is at some point, the transition becomes first order. And here is this point in between the line of second order transitions and the line of first order transitions. So that's what we call a tricritical point. And I'll discuss that in some more detail. Um, and in this experiment here, um, what people have done is used muon spin rotation to measure just what fraction of the volume of the system shows firm magnetic order. Okay. So the way they do it is they have, a, they have a muon beam. They shoot muons at the sample. The muons come, uh, come to a stop in the sample. And then the muon spin interacts with the local magnetization. So it's a local magnetization probe. Then the muon decays, and the decay products have a characteristic momentum distribution. So at what angles they come out of the sample tells you something about the local magnetization at the point where the muon decayed. 
Yeah. It's, a, it's an ingenious and fairly complicated uh, way to probe uh, magnetization. And here you see the result. So um, let's go to ambient pressure first. Tc is something like uh, not, not quite 30 kelvins, but very close to the one in zirconium zinc 2. Um, and here you see the volume fraction is 1. So um, that stuff is all as a function of temperature now. So at ambient pressure, as a function of temperature, um, we are at low temperature. The volume fraction is 1. The volume fraction stays very close to 1. Uh, as we increase the temperature, and then at some point it drops to zero, and here's Tc. Um, there aren't many data points here. It's hard to tell whether it does that continuously or discontinuously, but um, in any case, it's roughly a box function. Okay? So the volume fraction is one, and then it drops to zero. Now, um, let's go to 9.6 kilobars. So in this phase diagram, uh, the tricritical pressure is at roughly 12 kilobars. So the uh, light blue curve is at 9.6, so that's somewhere here. Okay. And you see it still does essentially the same thing. Uh, it goes to zero a bit more gradually. Now you actually have data points in here. So uh, that going to zero is a bit smeared out. Um, but the important point that I want to make right now is that at low temperatures, the volume fraction is still equal to 1. And now we get to 11.7 kilobars, which is right around here. Okay? It's close to the critical pressure. And now you see what happens is that even at zero temperature, the volume fraction is no longer 1. And as we go to higher pressure, um, unfortunately, my pointer is dying. Probably the batteries are getting weak. I think I lost it. Um, do we have a laser pointer I could use? Um, it's, not, it's not a big deal I can, I, I, I can do without. So if you look at the light green curve, um, that's around here. And you see even at zero temperature, it's still there, but it's weak. Yes. Oh, cool. Thank you. Oh, that's, wait a minute. This is yours and this is mine. So let <laughs> Hang on. Yes. It's a red one. OK. So here you see, it's, even at zero temperature, the volume fraction is less than 1. Okay. So somehow 20% of the stuff at this point uh, is not magnetically ordered, 20 volume percent. And if we go to 12.9 kilobars, which is somewhere here, um, you see it's only about half of the material volume-wise that's magnetically ordered, and then it loses it altogether. So these are, these are very interesting experiments um, for a whole variety of reasons. And um, if my time schedule works out as intended, then I will come back to these observations in the last lecture. For now, let me just say that um, the muon spin rotation community uh, considers these, this kind of in, in, uh, observation as a primary indication that the nearby phase transition is first order. Okay, so it's phase separation of some sort, and uh, that's characteristic of first order transitions. There are very interesting questions to be asked, which again, I may or may not come, have time to come back to. So let's just take that, um, that observation now for now as an indication of a first order transition. That that doesn't 
become isolated. There are a lot of other observations um, that indicate that the transition is first order. Um, actually, the first, the first suggestion was uh, via susceptibility measurements by um, Gil Lonsaric and Christian Fleiderer back in 1997. Okay. So here are two examples of these transitions that are first order. And now I need mine. Yes. So uh, here is another one of these materials. My laser pointer has recovered. Okay. This is uranium germanium 2. Um, so very different material. You see here we have transition metal compounds. Um, and uh, by the way, they are all metals. Okay, so all the materials I'm going to talk about are metals. So here's uranium germanium 2. Um, at ambient pressure, the Curie temperature is 47, 48 kelvins. Depends on the sample. It's again pressure dependent. Um, Curie temperature marches down as you increase the pressure. So that's a temperature pressure magnetic field phase diagram. And here is the tricritical point. So as we go below this uh, temperature via pressure, the transition becomes first order. And if one now turns on a magnetic field, then what happens is that the phase diagram develops this interesting wing structure. So out of the tricritical point um, come lines of second order transitions that delineate surfaces of first order transitions. So here, the light, this light blue surface is, of course, the first order transition from a spin polarized paramagnet to a spin po polarized paramagnet this way. And here you have these surfaces. And their meaning is that as you cross any of these surfaces, the magnetization changes discontinuously. So in that sense, they are surfaces of first order transitions delineated by lines of second order transitions. And eventually, these wings run out in a quantum critical point that lives in a finite non-zero magnetic field. So historically, um, that's actually a very convoluted story. Uh, what people were after was uh, a, quantum, a quantum critical point in zero field. And so when it turned out that these uh, materials are susceptible to pressure, people got excited and said, oh, wow, here, is, here we've got a handle on uh, studying the quantum thermomagnetic quantum critical point. And then they found invariably uh, they run into this tricritical point and the first order transition. So there's no quantum critical point after all. Um, and, but then it turns out that if you go to a, to a non-zero magnetic field, you do a quantum critical point, but not in zero field. So it's a fairly complicated phase diagram that these things show. And here's yet another example. That's uranium cobalt aluminum. So that's also one of these uranium compounds. That's an interesting one uh, because at ambient pressure, the system is believed to sit here. Okay, so it's just barely not magnetic. And now, what? Uh, so. Uh, People realize that the thing is almost ferromagnetic, that it's somehow very close to a ferromagnetic transition. And they said, ah, let's turn on a magnetic field and see what happens. And what happened was they saw these weird discontinuous changes in magnetization. And initially, it was very unclear what was going on there. And ultimately, it turned out that what they were doing is they were mapping out 
these wing, this wing structure in the phase diagram, uh, but they couldn't really get to the end of the wings. Okay, so here they intersected wings, and that's the, the red dots. Uh, these are the experimental points. And if you could apply negative pressure, then presumably you would see the entire structure, including the tricritical point. But you can't, because what you, what you are actually doing is you are slicing through the wings in a plane like this. Okay. So that's, that's this material. Now, um, disorder. Okay. I promised I would talk about disorder eventually, so here's a little preview. Um, so, historically, it wasn't as clear cut as I'm describing it here. So, for instance, initially in zirconium zinc 2, people saw a second order transition. Um, that turned out to lead us astray for a while um, because we actually believed the experimentalists. Um, then it turned out, as they made their samples cleaner and cleaner, um, the second order transition went away and they saw the tricritical point and the first order transition. Um, it's also an interesting story of why they actually did that. What they really were interested in was coexistence of magnetism and superconductivity. And um, if you want to do that, you can't have S-wave superconductivity because that instantly gets killed by the magnetic order. So it's got to be uh, some, some exotic superconductor, probably P-wave. And these things are very, very susceptible to quench disorder. So that's why the experimentalists were making their samples as clean as possible. And as a byproduct, uh, they found that in clean samples, the transition is first order rather than second order. So um, if you increase the quench disorder, losing it again, then, and this is now a theorist's cartoon, okay, um, then what happens is that your tricritical temperature actually goes down as a function of increasing disorder, and the tricritical wings shrink. And um, eventually, at a critical disorder, uh, you find that the tricritical point gets suppressed all the way to zero. And eventually, you do get a quantum critical point in zero field. Okay. Um, disorder does other things as well that are very interesting and complicate the picture. And uh, Thomas is going to talk about these at uh, some length. Um, I'll, I'll just mention them on the, on, on the next slide. So um, here is an example um, of a system where the Curie temperature is manipulated not by means of pressure, but by means of chemical composition. So this is uh, nickel aluminum, aluminum gallium, and um, it's been taken off stoichiometry. So there's a, a little bit less than uh, the stoichiometric amount of aluminum in here. And here you see the Curie temperature uh, plotted versus uh, the aluminum concentration, or rather uh, 1 minus the aluminum concentration. And you see it goes down from some 45 degrees or so to zero. And here it's plotted. Here what's plotted is Curie temperature to the 4 thirds versus composition. Uh, there are theoretical reasons. Oh, thank you. There are theoretical reasons to believe that 4 thirds is a good exponent here. Um, I'll get back to that. Now I have three of these things. Ah, OK. Ferdinand, before I lose yours, let me return that to you. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so here you see um, that looks like a, like a continuous transition. Um, if, you are, if you're not quite sure from this plot, here's the inverse susceptibility, the magnetic susceptibility, plotted against temperature to, to the four thirds. Again, uh, that's biased by theory, that four thirds exponent. And you see the inverse susceptibility um, actually uh, very nicely goes to zero here. So uh, the susceptibility seems to diverge, hallmark of a second order transition. And um, here is some more evidence for that, where the uh, square of the magnetization is plotted against temperature to the four thirds. And again, things seem to go to zero in a, in a continuous way. So that's uh, actually a, that, that's a very nice and, and, and complete uh, experimental paper that uh, maps out this uh, second order transition. And this order, um, like I said, it uh, does other things um, in addition to suppressing the, the tricritical point and, uh, and the wings. And so here are just uh, two examples. Here's another one of these uranium compounds. Um, that's one where, uh, where you can substitute thorium for uranium. And that introduces disorder, uh, nasty stuff, but some people do that. And um, as uh, a function of the thorium concentration, you see again Tc marches down. Then it develops this interesting tail here, and there's there's interesting uh, stuff related to Griffith uh, physics believed to be going on in this tale. And the reason that's believed to be the case is that um, one sees very unusual behavior of the magnetization as a function of the magnetic field, for instance. Um, uh, but uh, I, won't, I won't go into the details of this. OK. And. Finally, let me mention something that I will not dwell on in, in these lectures, but uh, it's still very interesting. So for the, for the point of this overview, I wanted to mention it. In uh, many of these materials, um, there is weird transport behavior observed in large parts of the phase diagram. So an, an ordinary metal that uh, is described by Fermi liquid theory um, has, a, has a resistivity, an electrical resistivity, that goes like the temperature squared at low temperatures. And here is uh, a false color plot for zirconium zinc 2 again, where the color indicates the exponent, the temperature exponent of the electrical resistivity at low temperatures. So 2 is somewhere here between blue and green. And the darker blue it is, the lower is the exponent. Um, so the darkest blue is something, is, is something like 3 halves. And as you, so here is the ferromagnetic phase. Here is the paramagnetic phase. That's the same phase diagram that we looked at before, this one here. And as you can see, the exponent is substantially less than the Fermi liquid value um, in a huge temperature pressure region. Okay. So up here, it behaves like it's supposed to, being a metal. Uh, but here, it doesn't. And you might say, well, there's a quantum phase transition going on, so uh, no wonder the, the transport looks, looks weird. Somehow, that expla explanation doesn't quite cut it, because if you look at the numbers here, so here's the critical pressure, 1.6, 1.7 gigapascal something. And uh, you see this anomalous exponent uh, is still observed at two times the critical pressure. Okay. So whatever is causing it can possibly have much to do with this quantum phase transition. It's just way too far away. Okay. And uh, here is a plot, uh, a more direct plot of the resistivity um, normalized to something versus uh, temperature to the 3 halves uh, 
and you see that's pretty nice straight lines. So there is a t to the 3 halves law for the electrical resistivity in large regions. And that's, again, not confined to um, zirconium zinc 2. Plenty other materials do that too. And um, while there are something between five and seven explanations for this floating around in the literature, uh, there's actually no consensus as to where that's coming from. So it's an, it's an interesting open problem. Cool. So um, that's just a, a rough overview over, of some of the phenomenology that's behind what I want to talk about. And um, in collaboration with uh, Manuel Brando at Dresden and uh, Malte Grosche at Cambridge, we uh, just wrote a review article about this, actually. So you can find it on the archives. And uh, it will come out in reviews of modern physics sometime this year, yeah. probably in the summer issue. OK, so any, any questions at this point? Yes. OK, so the question is uh, whether there are other indications of non-Fermi liquid behavior in, in these regions. In this phase region, in, yeah. In, in, this, in this region of the phase diagram, yeah. other than the transport. Um, that has not been looked at in detail for zirconium zinc 2. Um, the thing with the, about the resistivity is that it's easy to measure, of course. Um, so somebody, I, I, I forget who, um, uh, once said that uh, the resistivity is always the first thing to be measured and the last thing to be understood. Uh, <laughs> so for zirconium zinc 2, I think the answer is no. But for instance, in MNSI, uh, people have looked at, by means of neutron scattering, in more detail at what happens to the uh, heliomagnetism, for instance. And so um, what they found is that concurrent with this uh, t to the 3 halves behavior, um, there are also weird things happening to the uh, magnetic spiral. So for instance, the direction of the pitch vector uh, changes. And um, in the paramagnetic region, of course, there is no, strictly speaking, there's no long range order anymore. But they see short range spiral order uh, that's oriented in a different way. And uh, that's also not completely understood. So there's a lot to be done, I would say, in that area, both experimentally and, and theoretically. Anything else at this point? Okay, again, please, please interrupt me anytime. Okay. So. Good. So then uh, let's see whether we can understand uh, why that is. So um, what I what I again, essentially want to do is explain uh, where this type of phase diagram is coming from. What's the physics behind it? why it's so universally observed in clean metals, and why it's observed only at low temperatures, and why it doesn't like quench disorder. So these are the main questions that we are, that we are trying to answer. And in order to do so, uh, Let's, let's go back quite a bit and just review a few very basic uh, properties of ferromagnetic phase transitions. So um, let's talk, before we talk about quantum ferromagnets, let's talk about classical ones for a while. So um, of course, the ferromagnetic quantum, uh, the, sorry, the ferromagnetic phase transition is uh, one of the best known examples of uh, thermal continuous or second order phase transitions uh, due to iron, nickel, and cobalt. And that's been known since ancient times. Um, and here, here you see, for instance, um, the historic experiment uh, by Pierre Weiss on nickel uh, 
um, where they measured the magnetization versus the temperature and they found uh, it goes down and uh, follows approximately a square root. Uh, and here is a schematic phase diagram, so a magnetic field versus temperature. Um, here is the Curie temperature, here is uh, the ferromagnet, here is the polarized, here are the polarized phases, and what the experiment does here is it comes down in temperature at zero field straight towards this critical point. And uh, here's the magnetization versus temperature schematically. And uh, the solid line here actually is Weiss's very own uh, mean field theory. Okay. So um, he, uh, somebody, somebody asked uh, yesterday when we were meeting with the students whether it's possible to do both theory and experiment uh, at the same time. Uh, see, Pierre Weiss was still able to do it, okay, but that was a long time ago. That was uh, uh, 90 years ago. So these days, it's much, much harder because things have become so much more specialized. Um, cool. So for our purposes, um, this transition is second order, i.e., the magnetization, which is our order parameter, goes to zero continuously. There's no latent heat. Um, and uh, it's one of these transitions that looked pretty weird to people when Ehrenfest initially classified transitions into first and second order. Whereas if you go to a temperature below the Curie temperature, let's say you're at room temperature, and uh, you trigger the transition from the spin up phase to the spin down phase by means of a magnetic field, that's a classic example of a first order transition. Um, so the magnetization just jumps discontinuously at zero field. And then there's complications uh, due to domains and, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, to zeroth approximation, that's what it does. So that's uh, a classic, classic example of a thermal ferromagnetic phase transition. Now, as time went by, oh yes, and so, so uh, Pierre Weiss, of course, was quite pleased to see that his theory, which predicted a square root, fit his data pretty well. Now, uh, as time went by, uh, people got interested in these continuous phase transitions and uh, studied, studied uh, the region close to the transition in more detail. So they did more and more precise experiments closer and closer to the Curie temperature. And that uh, turned out to be difficult and require a lot of time and experimental skill and over the uh, while doing that, they lost their theoretical skills and uh, vice versa. Um, and um, so then in 1977, uh, let me just advertise uh, my late friend uh, Dave Cohen's thesis. For his thesis um, in 1977, he measured the exponent beta in nickel. So beta is the thing that tells you how the magnetization goes to zero at the Curie temperature. Okay. And um, actually almost, uh, so 40 years later, um, this value for beta, 0.358 plus minus 0.003, is still the accepted value uh, of beta in Heisenberg ferromagnets. Uh, that's quite an impressive thesis. Um, and here you see again the, the, the Weiss plot. Switch. Um, so uh, the conclusion was that if you look into the shaded region here close to TC, then you see, start seeing deviations from Weiss theory. And the exponent is actually markedly different from 1 half uh, at the end of the day. Okay. Um, cool. So um, why is that? 
what, what, what's wrong with Weiss' theory? Well, um, Weiss, of course, uh, considered an effective medium theory, or what we call a mean field theory now, where he said, let's look at one spin, let's say, in the average field that's produced by all of the other spins, okay? and ignore fluctuations of the magnetization. And if you do that, then you find this exponent 1 half. But this, the magnetization does fluctuate, and the fluctuations get bigger and bigger as you get closer to Tc. And so as a result of that, you eventually find these deviations. Turns out, actually, that that's true in three dimensions. But if we could do experiments in, let's say, five, six, or 17 spatial dimensions, then a ferromagnet in such a high dimensional space, we have every reason to believe, would strictly follow Weiss theory. The exponent would actually be one half. Okay. And um, whether or not the fluctuations are strong enough to uh, lead to deviations from mean field theory, that's known as the Ginsburg criteria, and I will come back to that later. Um, and so in the case of these magnets, um, there is a critical dimension that's equal to 4. So if you are above that, then mean field theory works. If you are below that, then it doesn't. And that concept will become important in what follows. Turns out 4 is the, is, is the upper critical dimension only for this a certain class of magnets here. And we'll, we'll, we'll encounter other cases later. Now, the magnetization is only one observable that shows interesting behavior. <coughs> so other, other stuff that you can measure that shows critical behavior is the susceptibility, of course. So the susceptibility diverges with an exponent that's usually uh, denoted by gamma. And turns out in these Heisenberg ferromagnets, gamma is uh, roughly 1.4. And the theoretically probably most important uh, property here is the correlation length, which tells you that if you have a magnetization fluctuation at one point in space and a magnetization fluctuation at another point in space, um, to what extent these fluctuations can see each other. Okay. So if you uh, look at the correlation function of the magnetization, uh, then that falls off on a spatial scale given by the correlation length. And that thing diverges with an exponent that's usually called nu. And it is uh, close to 0.7 for these uh, materials. Now, the values of these exponents turn out to depend only on a few basic properties of the system. Spatial dimensionality is one of them. Dimensionality of the order parameter is another one. They're different for Heisenberg ferromagnets and Ising ferromagnets, for instance. They do not depend on macroscopic details like crystal structure, band structure, and so on. If you look at uh, iron, nickel, cobalt, um, they all have the same critical exponents, even though uh, they are quite different in microscopic detail. And so the, these broad classes of materials that all have the same critical behavior are known as universality classes. So iron, nickel, and cobalt belong to the same universality class. And this, these observations of critical behavior that's not mean feel like, uh, that spawned a, a huge theoretical development um, in the 1970s. So uh, Ken Wilson, of course, uh, won the Nobel Prize for, for that. And uh, that led to the, to the development of the renormalization group and scaling and, and, and all of that. Scaling historically came earlier, but then the renormalization group allowed us to uh, actually derive scaling. So here's an example of scaling behavior. Let's say we look at the magnetization as a function of distance from criticality and temperature space and magnetic field. So little t here 
is, uh, let's say, the dimensionless distance from the Curie temperature. And um, as a function of these two variables, it turns out the magnetization close to the critical point is only a function of a particular combination of the two variables. It's not an independent function of the two variables. And here is one way to write it. Um, one can write it as little t to the beta. So that's that critical exponent we had a second ago. And then times a function of the magnetic field over little t to another exponent only, rather than a function of h and t separately. And that other exponent turns out to be the product of two critical exponents. One is beta and one is delta. Delta is the one that tells you how the magnetization varies at criticality as a function of the magnetic field. So what scaling predicts is that if you look at, for instance, a plot of magnetization versus field, or here it's field versus magnetization, then you see for temperatures higher than the Curie temperature, um, the magnetization increases as a function from zero as a function of field. Um, for temperatures below the Curie temperature, what happens is that in zero field, the magnetization is non-zero, plus or minus, depending on the uh, value of, of whether the field is plus or minus. <coughs> and then it still increases, of course, as a function of field. But you get this whole set of curves here that fill your HM space. And what scaling says is if you plot the correct um, combination of things here, then these curves will all collapse onto two curves, one for all temperatures below Tc and one for all temperatures above Tc. That's the, that's the visual uh, message that's given by uh, the scaling law. See, if we take m, divide by t to the beta, then the result will be a function only of this combination. That actually works. So here is an example. Um, this is an insulating uh, magnet, but it doesn't matter for this purpose. And here you see uh, people have done literally what I just described. And here you see the data points, these, the, these whole families of curves all collapse onto two curves one for t less than tc and one for t greater than tc. And these plots were produced uh, long before the, uh, the renormalization group was developed. And uh, they were actually so that they, they were important in guiding uh, the theory along. So scaling theory was, phenomen was a phenomenological development before the renormalization group. Um, I lost track of which is which. That's the wrong one. OK. Um, another point I want to make here, uh, because I'll need that later on, is that um, the renormalization group is actually much more useful than just describing critical points and phase transitions. And that's something that's not as well appreciated as its utility for critical points. So it turns out one can use it to describe entire phases. Um, so there are, there's a renormalization group fixed point, for instance, <coughs> that describes the ferromagnetic phase. And another one that describes the paramagnetic phase. <coughs> so these are called stable fixed points as opposed to critical fixed points. And I'll come back to that later on when we talk about Fermi liquids and uh, what they do in conjunction with metallic magnets.
And um, that, that uh, issue is, for instance, discussed in the book by Shankeng Ma, which is very nice. Good. So <coughs> now, how can we theoretically deal with, uh, with these issues? How, how do we describe this kind of stuff? Um, it's done by, by means of field theory. So um, one looks at uh, what's usually called an action, which is really a Hamiltonian divided by temperature. Um, <coughs> that's a functional of an appropriate order parameter field. So in our case, if you're interested in magnets, then the order parameter field would be the magnetization. For a thermal phase transition, is the magnetization as a function of uh, spatial position x. Okay. And um, here is a simple model functional. So let's say it should, it should have a quadratic, term quadratic in the order parameter. Um, uh, inhomogeneities in the order parameter will cost energy. So um, let's put in a term that depends on the gradient of the magnetization squared. And uh, then there will be a quartic term. There will be higher order terms that uh, turn out not to be important. And let's couple a magnetic field to our magnetization by means of a Zeeman term. Uh, so if this is supposed to be the Hamiltonian normalized by temperature, then the field, the Zeeman term, will come with a minus sign, okay, minus h dot m. And um, the coefficients here, little t, c, and u, they are just parameters of this uh, theory that's usually referred to as a Lennox ginzburg wilson theory. And the partition function we obtain as a functional integral over all possible configurations of the spatially dependent magnetization. Okay. So uh, it's like a path integral in quantum mechanics. What you do is you take a particular magnetization configuration, um, you calculate the action, you exponentiate it, then you take a different uh, magnetization configuration, do the same thing, you add all these things up. Okay? What comes out is your partition function. And once you know the partition function, of course, you know all of the thermodynamic properties of the system. In particular, all of this complicated um, critical behavior um, is actually contained in this quantity z. So that by itself tells us that it can't be easy to calculate that thing. So um, to get an idea of what might happen, let's do a very simple approximation. Let's do what Pierre Weiss did and just ignore fluctuations of the magnetization. Let's say the thing is a constant. It's independent of position, just equal to a number m. Uh, well, in that case, we can do the functional integral. Okay? We don't have to do any, any integral at all. Uh, we just plug in numbers. And you see what comes out is a lambda of free energy, uh, of free energy density rather, if I divide by the volume. Um, so I get a free energy density that's um, little t times my magnetization squared plus u m to the fourth. Gradient is now 0. Uh, minus hm. So this is actually the free energy that Pierre Weiss considered. And as a function of magnetization, um, you see it looks like this for little t greater than 0. It has this characteristic minimum at non-zero m for t less than 0. And at t equal to 0, it goes like m to the fourth, uh, all in zero field. So you see, in this theory, at little t equal to 0, there is a second order phase transition where the free energy's minimum changes from being at m equal to 0 to m not equal to being to 0. And if you work out what it does uh, as a function of little t, then you see here we have our exponent 1 half. Magnetization goes like the square root of minus t. At t equal to 0, the magnetization goes like 
Uh, if you minimize this, then it goes like field to the one third. So here's the exponent delta. That's equal to 3 in this case. And um, in the paramagnetic phase, the magnetization goes like field over little t. And if we calculate the susceptibility, the MDH in the simple theory just goes like 1 over t. So as we approach criticality, uh, susceptibility diverges like 1 over t, the exponent gamma is equal to 1. So that's a very, very simple theory. And uh, it gives mean field or Weissian exponents. And uh, as we know, that's not a particularly good approximation close to the critical point. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. This one here? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So that's. OK, so here, this is just. Uh, so M, M is a vector, OK? Oh, M is a vector. M is a vector in this. M is a vector. So it's M dot M squared is what I mean by this notation. Okay. Yes, OK, cool. OK, yes. And, and similarly, similarly here, what I actually mean. When I, when I just write nabla m the whole squared, okay? so by nabla m squared, I, what I actually mean is di mj di mj summed over i and j from 1 to 3. So it, it's all rotationally invariant. That's actually in dimensionality independent. Oh. Right? So mean, mean field theory predicts uh, these values of exponents for all values of the dimensionality. And that turns out to be correct, in this case, for d greater than 4. But it's not correct for d less than 4. Okay. okay. Now, um, again, for later reference, let's dwell on the susceptibility here a little bit more. So here we said, in the simple mean field theory, the magnetic susceptibility, the MDH, just goes like 1 over t. Now what if we take into account the wave number dependence of the susceptibility? Well, then you see we need to take the position dependence into account here. And clearly what happens is we, we have a gradient squared term here. If we Fourier transform, that becomes a wave number squared. So uh, the susceptibility, which is the thing, or the inverse susceptibility, which is the thing that multiplies the m squared terms, that will go like t plus c times wave number squared. And here it is, oops, sorry. Here it is um, in the homogeneous susceptibility goes like 1 over t, but the wave number dependent one goes like 1 over t plus c k squared. Um, let me pull out the 1 over t and rewrite that as 1 over t over 1 plus k squared times something that must be a length squared. And that's our correlation length, actually, in mean field theory. So if we look at it, the correlation length squared is c over t. So the correlation length psi is square root c over t, um, which tells us that our exponent nu is 1 half um, in our mean field theory. And this. This uh, form of the uh, susceptibility is named after Ornstein and Zernike, who studied it in, studied it in uh, classical fluids. Okay. Um, also interesting is that as we go to criticality, if we let t, little t go to 0, then you see our susceptibility 
goes like 1 over k squared. So at criticality, as a function of wave number going to 0, the susceptibility diverges like 1 over k squared. And that's one indication of the long-range correlations that happen near the critical point. So as we approach criticality, um, magnetization fluctuations start talking to each other over larger and larger length scales. And that's the physical meaning of this diverging length scale here we call the correlation length. It's also often referred to as um, a, a soft mode or, in particle theory lingo, a massless mode or excitation. Um, so in, it's only a particular example. There's plenty of reasons for why one can have soft excitations in a system. Here it's a critical soft mode. It's brought about by um, the critical point. Okay. And by softness, we mean that in the denominator, there is no constant protecting this, sing this k squared singularity. Okay. Um, cool. Another thing for later reference um, suppose you look at the dynamics of a system near a critical point. And for a thermal phase transition, we don't actually have to do that unless we really want to. But suppose we want to. So suppose we are doing an experiment. Um, and then it's important to know how long do we have to wait, for instance, after changing some parameters uh, for our system to reach equilibrium again. Okay, so the relaxation time is an, important, is an important issue. And it turns out as you go closer and closer to a critical point, you need to have, you'll have to wait longer and longer for the system to reach equilibrium. That's actually very plausible. Once we say that the fluctuations talk to each other over longer and longer time scales, um, you can imagine, in order to reach equilibrium, the system will have to rearrange itself over larger and larger length scales, and that will take more and more time. So there is a time scale that diverges near the transition, and uh, that time scale diverges as the correlation length to a certain power. That's another critical exponent known as the dynamical critical exponent. And that's usually denoted by little z. Okay. Um, so that phenomenon I just described is known as critical slowing down. Uh, near criticality, everything happens on a longer and longer time scale. And um, now, what happens is, well, this is just, uh, I've said this before, it's fine. So fluctuations now lead to a second order transition uh, with exponents that are different from these simple mean field exponents. Um, and they fall into their appropriate universality class. So for instance, getting back to uh, the question we discussed a second ago, so here for my model, I assumed a vector valued order parameter, um, m vector. Um, if you take, so that's uh, rotationally invariant. It doesn't, the energy doesn't depend on which uh, direction the magnetization points in. If you take an icing ferromagnet, for instance, um, where the magnetization can only be either up or down, uh, then the exponents will be different. Okay. So uh, there would be a different universality class. And finally, again, fluctuations are important only in upper critical dimension. And in this case, that's d equals 4. And that was first, um, that was first uh, discussed, actually, by uh, a guy named Levanyuk, which is why it's called the Ginsburg criteria. So, uh, so um, this, is, this gives me an excuse to uh, just demonstrate a certain type of reasoning that will be, will be important later. 
so let me let me do that real real quickly on the on the blackboard and um, explain uh, where that d equals four comes from. Um, actually, in fairness to Landau and Lifshitz, uh, they call it the uh, the, the Levanyu-Gensburg criterion. Everybody else calls it the Gensburg criterion. Um, here's what, what, what Levanyuk uh, argued. Um, he said, let's look at fluctuations of the order parameter. Okay? So we have a local magnetization m of x. And that's equal to its average. So let's say that's just the average of the fluctuating order parameter plus deviations from that mean for fluctuations delta m of x. And now we are asking how important are these fluctuations? Okay. So do I need to take them seriously? Well, so we need to get some, some measure for that, some quantitative way to, to ask that question. Um, they can be positive or negative. Um, let me do it for, for just for an icing order parameter here. So m, m is number valued now. They can be positive or negative. So uh, we certainly have to square the thing because we don't care which way uh, it deviates. And um, we are asking whether on average the, the fluctuations matter. So let's take the square of delta m and average it. And um, oops. And then we are asking whether they will be important for the critical behavior. So um, near criticality, the system is coherent over a length scale psi, over correlation length. And for larger lengths, it loses the coherence. So let's take our fluctuation squared and integrate over a volume psi to the d. So uh, that's a fluctuation volume. And then normalize by dividing by our fluctuation volume. So this is a reason, this quantity is a reasonable measure of the strength of the fluctuations averaged over a fluctuation volume. And whether or not these fluctuations are important should depend on how large or small these such averaged fluctuations squared are to the average value of m squared. Okay. So if this quantity is much smaller than m squared, then we would expect the fluctuations to not be very important. So this is the idea of the ginsburg levanyuk criterion. And now um, let's see whether we can get some idea about uh, the quantity on the left-hand side. Yeah. So. Um, how do we do this? We can't possibly calculate this exactly, right? Because uh, that's very hard. But we can certainly calculate it in mean field theory, um, or strictly speaking, in Gaussian theory, which is Gaussian fluctuations about mean field theory. So the idea is to say, if we take the simple theory and ask whether that simple theory is internally consistent, okay, that will give us a pretty good idea of whether or not it will ultimately work. So that we can do. And in order to do it, let's uh, rewrite our integral. 
So here I have a spatial integral over a fluctuation volume. And I want delta m of x squared average. Let's rewrite that in Fourier space. So here we have a delta m of x, delta m of x averaged. So that is the delta m, delta m correlation function um, at zero position, which means it's the thing summed over all wave numbers. So if I Fourier transform, then that's something like my correlation volume times a sum or integral over all wave numbers. And now I have delta m of k mod squared averaged. It's just a Fourier transform of uh, the left-hand side. But this here is my susceptibility. This is chi of k. So what I've got here is a correlation volume times a wave number integral over chi of k. And again, chi of k is in general very complicated, but in the simple um, mean field, Gaussian, Ornstein, Zernike, whatever we want to call it theory, we actually know what it is. Here it is. It's um, proportional to 1 over 1 plus xi squared k squared. So let's plug that in. So within the simple theory, this is proportional to xi to the d integral dk 1 over 1 plus k squared xi squared. So that integral we can just do by power counting. So let me pull out a 1 over xi squared. Then I get xi to the d minus 2 integral dk k to the d minus 1, 1 over 1 plus 1 over, let me write it as k squared plus 1 over xi squared. And now let's scale, um, let's scale, um, wait a minute, have I done this correctly? Psi to the d, hang on. Wait a second. I've forgotten, I've forgotten the 1 over t, OK? So I need to put the 1 over t back in, and that eats my, that eats my xi to the, my, my xi squared, OK? So if I take the t into account, this is actually what it is, OK? And now I scale k with uh, 1 over xi, and then it becomes xi to the d times xi to the minus d plus 2 minus d plus 2. And so the result is that uh, it scales like psi squared. So that is how the left-hand side of my Ginsburg criterion behaves. And the right-hand side is just m squared, but m squared goes like little t. Right? m goes like the square root of little t. Um, that was in the previous slide, but that was the mean field beta equals 1 half. So this goes like um, mod, the, mod t, actually, um, because t is negative on the order, in the ordered phase. So that goes like 1 over xi squared, because xi diverges like 1 over square root of t in the simple theory. And so now I conclude that my criteria becomes um, xi to the 2 
minus d must be less than uh, 1 over psi squared. Okay? Or psi to the d must be greater than psi to the fourth. And psi is large. So close to the transition, um, psi diverges. And so I see this is true provided d is greater than 4. So if d is greater than 4, then our simple theory is internally consistent. And we have reason to believe that it gives the correct critical exponents. For d less than 4, um, we know that the fluctuations are going to be important. And we need to do a better job. And d equals 4 is the marginal case, of course. So interesting stuff happens there. So, good. So that's the, that's the uh, Ginsburg criteria. Raj, when did I start? Okay. Okay. So shall okay. Let me let, 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 let me ask for questions at this point. So either either uh, either you know everything I've said so far, um, or I've been completely unclear. Yes. Okay, let me, okay let, me, let, let me elaborate on, on, on that a little bit. So um, what I mean when I say that is um, let's go, to, let's go to, to, to this expression here, right? So we look at delta m of x squared average. Let's look at a somewhat more uh, complicated object. Let's look at delta m of x delta m of y and average that. Okay. So that's the magnetization fluctuation at some point times the magnetization fluctuation at another point, and that averaged. So that is the correlation function we would call chi uh, of x minus y, because once we average, on average it can depend only on the distance between the two. Positions. Okay, can depend on the positions themselves. Okay, and that thing turns out to fall off exponentially in uh, either the ferromagnetic or the paramagnetic phase. Uh, so it will go like e to the minus. Um, it's a bit more complicated as a power law prefactor, but the important point for this discussion here, it goes like e to the minus distance x minus y over psi. Okay. So here we see explicitly if the two points are less than psi apart, then there's a strong overlap, strong, strong correlation between the two fluctuations. If they are farther apart, then that correlation drops off exponentially. And as we approach the critical point, we have to go out farther and farther in order for the two not to talk to, to each other anymore. So that's what I meant. That's right. That's, that's right. That power law takes over. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yes. No. Uh, not quite. What we are doing is we are saying let's approximate. Let's do an approximation where we replace the position dependent fluctuating m by its average. And that average we simply call m. 
A. Or in this language here where I've taken M apart into its mean and its fluctuation, I assume that I just drop the fluctuations because the average of the fluctuation is by definition zero. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying the system is homogeneous. I'm saying I'm replacing the fluctuating magnetization by its average as an approximation. Both. Um, now, at the transition we are discussing so far, which happens at a finite temperature, um, quantum fluctuations are not important. It's all thermal fluctuations. Okay? But you can play the same game, and we will play the same game uh, tomorrow, uh, for a transition at a very low or even zero temperature. And there are no thermal fluctuations. It's all quantum fluctuations. You still play the same game. You still say, the first thing I will ever try is I just ignore the fluctuations okay, and replace my order parameter by its average. And in this case, what I'm, what I'm then neglecting is quantum fluctuations. And the criteria would be similar. Similar, but different. And we'll get to that, yes. And the, the important difference will be that here I can, I can make these arguments without ever having to talk about any dynamics. The dynamics are completely separate. I can say I just wait however long it takes for my system to approach equilibrium, and then I calculate the partition function. In quantum statistical mechanics, we can't do that. Um, we'll see uh, tomorrow on and, and the next day that the dynamics and the statics are intrinsically coupled in quantum statistical mechanics. And we cannot possibly talk about thermodynamics without talking about that dynamical exponent z as well. And that will mess up the Ginsburg criteria. Okay? So uh, this will change, but the basic idea will be the same. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. Um, I know two criteria that can be applied to figure out what is the dimensional one and the other one would be dimensional analysis. Yes. Um, okay. Um, so can you comment on, uh, um, I always thought that Ginsburg is a little bit more com complicated in practice and even conceptually. So, so um, has dimensional analysis taken over, or is Ginsburg still used in the field? Or can you just? Ah, uh, okay. To my mind, to my mind, um, that's more or less a pedagogical issue. Mm -hmm. So I would say you are you are absolutely correct in saying that um, once I've. Once I've learned enough um, what underlies the, the Wilsonian renormalization group, I don't have to go through this. I can just count powers. I can just do dimensional analysis, and I'll get to the same answer. And that's a much faster way to get to the answer, and possibly a cleaner way to get to the answer. Um, uh, but it's also less. To, to, but that's a sub subjective statement. It's also maybe it's also less intuitive, probably, unless one has developed a lot of intuition already. Uh, okay. So um, this, the, I mean, what I what I still like about this is that it's it, it, it's so physic it's so physically intuitive what we are doing here. Um, but the answer is the same. Okay. Now. Once I get to the quantum phase transition, um, it's actually, it becomes more involved. And so nobody ever does it. You all count powers. It's interesting that you say that. I, I've just been in a talk, and um, it was pointed out that the first argument in favor of dimensional analysis was made in, by Lord Rayleigh, I think, in 19. Probably in, 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 in the context of turbulence. Yeah, wave dynamics and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. The argument was there's nothing more intuitive than 
Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's okay, 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 yes. Um, I, I also remember um, when, when I first looked at the book by Ma, about modern theory of critical phenomena, I was completely confused. I had no idea what the guy was doing. Um, uh, I was used to uh, taking a Hamiltonian and uh, starting doing Heisenberg equations of motion and actually doing calculations. And I said, what is this? Uh, they're just waving their hands and out comes stuff. Where does this come from? Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's a matter of, I think, how one is trained and, 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 and what, kind of, what kind of thinking one is, one is used to. Yeah. Oh yeah, let's let's look at the wing diagram again. Here's a nice one. Um, okay, well, let's see. So the phase diagram changes. I mean, the only phases we've got here, the only f actual phases we've got are the ferromagnetic phase that exists below the Curie temperature and uh, below the critical pressure in zero field, right? So that phase lives in this uh, plane here. And then we've got the paramagnetic phase here, and then we've got the spin polarized uh, phases. Okay. So I would say what changes as I introduce this order, so that's the actual experimental diagram. Now let's go to the cartoon. Um, so what changes now is the relative size of the various phases and regions in the phase diagram. Um, it's actually not introducing or killing any phases. Okay. It just change, it moves around uh, the phase transition lines between them. Does that answer the question? Yes. Uh, okay, so I thought there are two different phases. Which ones? Uh, the phase which are separated by these guys. Okay, so, so you're asking, you're asking is, the fa is, is the region in between uh, these, um, in between these wings, okay? Is that a separate phase? Yeah, compared to the phase of the... I would, no, no, not really. See, everywhere here, it's a paramagnet. Everywhere between the t, little t plane and the wing, it's a spin polarized paramagnet. As I cross the wing, um, it's still a spin polarized paramagnet, but a different one because it has a different value of the magnetization. So in that sense, um, you could say, well, as I suppress the wings, yes, I'm kind of killing a phase. But then you see you can actually, it, it's first order, right? So you can always go from this phase into that phase by going around. So it becomes semantics at it, it becomes semantics at some point. There, there's no symmetry being broken by going from here to there, right? So it's like it's like taking a taking a classical fluid and going from liquid to gas by going around the critical point. Um, nothing dramatic ever happens on that trip, and the same is true here. Then it's a different phase diagram. Yes. Okay, that's not the case here. Yes. Uh, 
So I say that again. What becomes less important? Delta m squared. I mean the yeah, the delta m squared, yeah. As the spatial dimension increases, um, what happens is that the phase space available to the fluctuations increases. So you see what we are calculating here, the crucial quantity, is a wave number, a d-dimensional wave number integral over a susceptibility. Now the susceptibility diverges as 1 over k squared in any dimension. But that 1 over k squared, that large susceptibility, gets spread out over d dimensions in phase space. So it gets kind of diluted in the larger dimensions. And that's why. Okay. That's a general statement. Fluctuations, any given fluctuation is always stronger in a lower dimension than in a higher dimension. And the reason is simply this phase space argument here that's encoded in the integration measure in k space. Anything else? OK, then I think I've used my 90 minutes. And um, actually, my slides indicate that this is a good break point. So why don't we break here and uh, then continue tomorrow? Thank you. <laughs>